So, hi guys, welcome. Thank you very much for taking the time to come to my talk. If you're here because you think I'm the beer farmers because you actually read the printed booklet, um, I'm not. They are downstairs right now. Am I correct? Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, so just saying, I'm not the beer farmers. I don't even like beer. Um, so, my name... Switch it on. That helps. Great. So my name is Helena Lucas. I am a student at Edinburgh Napier University. I am uh, studying computer security or cyber security and forensics. I'm currently on placement in a financial institution and I used to be on the ENISEC committee. Yay. Um, yay. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Uh, the only reason I'm doing this talk is because I am trying to get more Twitter followers than my dad. <laughs> he is he is at 1,524, so I need quite a few more, so please follow me. My name is Hella underscore look. Um, I do go by Hella rather than Helena sometimes, that's because I'm from Poland, and in Poland that's what people call me. If you are going to try and pronounce it, it's Hella like Hella cool rather than Hella like Hela or Hala or anything like that. Um, apart from security, I also organize or organized TEDx conferences, and I'm very into TED Talks, etc. So if you want to talk about that, we can chat afterwards. And I also do magic tricks. <laughs> So I'm going to start off with a disclaimer. I am woefully underqualified to give this talk. I have not done machine learning at university. I did one machine learning project at work, um, and this is the talk that I wish I had seen before I had said yes to the project, I think. Um, if you have done machine learning at university in an academic environment or at work, go away. This really isn't the talk for you. You're not going to learn anything new, I don't think. Um, so, I did a poll on Twitter. Uh, should I start my Latour to Hack 19 talk with a magic trick? A few people said no. Is anybody who said no in the audience? <laughs> uh, one. <laughs> okay, uh, but most people said yes, so I guess I will start with a magic trick then. I do need a volunteer. You, you were first. Sorry, you was first. Could you come up here? What's your name? Murray Lai. Murray Lai. Sorry, Murray Lai. Murray Lai. Yeah, Lai. L-Y-N-E. Everything's okay. wrong. Big round of applause. Hi. I need Hi. you to stand here in between these lines, otherwise the camera can't get us. So actually, this is an interactive magic trick, so I need everybody to stand up for this. <laughs> Sorry? That, um, can I get like a like a view to the camera? Yeah, so guys, if you like, you think you're standing behind the camera, you just want to sort of part way slightly just so. Uh, Thank you. I'm so sorry about this. I didn't think this through. Yeah, there you go. That's good. Okay, awesome. So now, I want everybody to copy Murray, okay? So what I'd like you to do is stick your hands out like this. Like this. Mm -hmm. That includes you, Kinga. <laughs> we'll wait. Okay, now this is the difficult bit, okay? I want you to turn your hands over like this. This is my favorite kids trick show, but kids show trip rather. Okay, it's very difficult. Now, very carefully, like this. Uh, yep, yeah, perfect. Does everybody have it? Stop waving. This is an important bit. Okay, now when I count to three, I want you to Clasp your fingers like this, okay? But only once I count to three, okay? Like that. Okay. You got it. Okay, so one, two, three. Okay, and now we're going to do the magic, okay? We're going to go abracadabra. <laughs> Everybody has to say it. Abracadabra. Thank you. Boom, chicka boom. <laughs> and now the magic's going to happen. <laughs> it's the magic trick. Right, big round of applause for Murray. I didn't start my timer. Oh, thanks. This also works at kids' shows. Hi, welcome. Please take a seat. Hi, welcome. Please take a seat. 
Okay. Right. Morning, James. Good, thanks, mate. Cool. So, let's start with the boring stuff. So, um, I will preface this with this uh, talk. Thank you for laughing. I also like this. Um, I will start with this with saying that this talk is mainly aimed at my peers. And one of the questions I get a lot is, how is machine act learning actually different from just a really long, complex if statement? And I have to say that it took me quite a while to actually understand it. And in some ways, if you think about it, when you distill it down to the very basics, it is actually still kind of if statements. It's just that they're built up into this nice big complex thing which deals with different kinds of problems. So um, machine learning is a subset of AI that builds algorithms that allow computers to learn and <coughs> perform tasks from data uh, instead of being explicitly programmed to do things. So um, what I'm trying to say here is that what machine learning can do is that it can deal with a probabilistic and stochastic environment, so one that's changing and different. And it can deal with new data well, whereas an if statement has to be told from the very start what it's going to be dealing with. So if we try and think about it and take an example, let's say we've got an if statement that is trying to define whether something is a dog or not. Right? If we've got a dog that looks like a regular dog, the if statement could go through asking if it's got four legs, if it's got two ears, if it is fluffy, you know, that kind of thing. And it will define at the end that it is a dog. But what if we've got a dog that, for example, doesn't fulfill one of those criteria? Maybe it doesn't have an ear or doesn't have a leg. Don't know why it got so dark. But, <laughs> but basically, a machine learning algorithm can actually take the dog and compare it to other dogs or look at its features as a whole and by that, define whether it is a dog or not, instead of going through these defined if statements that we would otherwise be using. Now, I am going to take a little bit of time uh, to go through the differences between artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning. Um, AI, in general, uh, is a term that is misused a lot, but in, it's a, a program that can learn, sense, reason, and adapt. <coughs> Uh, machine learning is an application of AI that focuses on the development of computer programs that can learn from themselves. Now, I want to talk a little bit about deep versus shallow learning as well. Um, and to explain this, I need to just quickly go over what features are. So when we've got a data set, for example, data set of dogs, features will be things like ears, or number of ears, or number of legs, or you know, fluffiness scale, etc. So, uh, in shallow learning, we need domain experts, so in security, people like us, uh, to determine which features in a data set are important. Uh, in deep learning, and this is out of scope of this talk, and it's a little more complex and I completely do not understand it, um, the program itself determines what's important and which features it's going to use. So this is a very simplified graph. In real life, it actually looks a little more like this, but we're not going to go into that because we don't have to. So, um, one drunken any sec night out, my friend Gordon said something like this. Uh, I don't understand unsupervised machine learning. Can't you just use the supervisor that the supervised machine learning uses to supervise the unsupervised machine learning? The short answer to that is, well, no. <laughs> um... However, this is an important distinction. So supervised learning requires training on a large labeled data set. So whenever you have, let's say, network connections, you will have labeled malicious ones and labeled non-malicious ones. And whenever you run your machine learning model, you uh, let the algorithm sort the data, look at the labels, and give the model feedback so that it can get better about whether it's classifying it in the right way. This would be in a specific case of classification, but in general, you get the idea. You need labels. For uh, oh, and two examples of supervised learning would be classification and regression. Where classification, you are trying to determine if something, for example, is a dog or not, and in regression, you are going to try and predict a um, continuous uh, variable. So, for example, a, a number, a square feet of a house. We'll go into this later. Um, hi, come in, please. <laughs> for, uns 
Unsupervised learning, on the other hand, does not require labeled data. Um, at a higher level, it will look at how similar things are and uh, to each other and use this measure to group them together in certain ways. The differences between different uh, unsupervised machine learning methods is how they define the similarity and how they group the things. Um, so there's two kind of main or three main types of uh, unsupervised learning. There's clustering, and it works for finding inherent groups in data. There's association, uh, where you want to discover rules. For example, who, people who click on X uh, will also do Y. I realize I said three, I meant two, I can't count. You don't need maths for machine learning. You do, actually. But. Um, so I'm going to point you guys to this brilliant cheat sheet. This is uh, for scikit-learn, which is a Python library, which is great for machine learning. You just import something, and everything works. Not, not really true, but it's a great place to start. Um, now, if you look at this, you might just be going, what? Um, I will go through all the different components, and we will start with a regression. Does this have a... Oh. What I'm trying to do is have a laser pointer. Yes, okay, brilliant. So, uh, given a thousand hooses, because we're in Edinburgh, uh, you can plot them on a graph, right? Where we've got, I got this wrong last time, we've got the price on the x-axis and the square feet on the y-axis. I can tell x from y. Um, basically, what you can do in regression is you can try and fit a line to determine what the usual price of a house with a certain square footage would be, depending on other houses already in the given area. Now, this is a very simplistic example because you're only using two dimensions. Usually you would be doing this in three dimensions or four dimensions or five, but don't think about that too much because it hurts your brain. Um, and in regression, we also need to think about overfitting. Now, um, basically, I'm stepping over the line. Basically, um, when you're building a machine learning model, you need to make sure that it's going to work for new data. So if, for example, we go back to this example, and we draw a line that instead of going straight like this, kind of went up and down and up and down and fit every single little data point, <coughs> we would end up with an inaccurate result whenever we're trying to find a new price for a house of a certain square footage. Um, and you can see this here. So if you underfit it, your results aren't meaningful at all. If you fit it well, you're going to get it just right. And if you overfit it, um, well, you're not going to get any meaningful results in the end. And I have a mean for this. I'll just let you read it and not laugh. Great, okay. So uh, let's keep on going with the graph. The next thing is classification, which is a supervised learning approach in which the computer program learns from labeled data and uses this to classify a new observation. So it could be by class, it could be multi-class, so it could be saying, is this a dog or not? It could be saying, what type of dog is this? I really like dogs. Um, now, why would we use classification? It actually has loads and loads of uh, use cases for machine learning. You can, for example, classify things as malicious or not, as you know, malware or not, as phishing or not, as spam or not spam, which is called ham. This is a scientific term. Um, and the issue with classification is finding good um, labeled data sets, because that is difficult. And I have a, another meme. I really like it. Right. Uh, the next one we'll get into is clustering. Um, it's an unsupervised learning method which is used as a process to find meaningful structure or groupings in a set of data. Uh, it uses similarity or dissimilarity to put things into categories. Um, sorry, not categories, into groups. Um, you can use this uh, for explorative analysis. So whenever you've got a data set when, that you don't know much about and you want to figure out what kind of data is in the data set, you can use clustering to put it into different groups and learn from your data. Um, finding possible partitions is all about defining how you measure how similar things are. Um, and clustering can also be used in security and other domains, of course, to found, find outliers. So if you've got, for example, 
three groups like this, you could say that these two are outliers, which is really useful with anomaly detection, which we will get into later. Now, the last thing uh, is dimensionality reduction. And <coughs> please come in. Um, dimensionality reduction is the process of reducing the number of random variables in a data set. So whenever you've got a, um, let's go back to the dog example, you've got a data set of dogs and you've got lots of different features, you might have features that aren't useful for the problem that you're trying to solve. So for example, you might have the owner's name and what you're trying to determine is whether the dog is of a certain breed. That feature is obviously not really going to inform your data uh, your machine learning model whatsoever. So you can just get rid of it. Um, so dimensionality reduction is um, very useful for um, excluding or influencing the ex excluding or reducing the influence of this irrelevant data on your machine learning model. And this is important because of the curse of dimensionality, which you have to say like that in your head every time. <laughs> So machine learning excels at analyzing data across multiple dimensions. Humans really struggle to even think about more than like four or five. Hi, please come in, take a seat. Um, however, the more dimensions you have and the more, uh, the more space you need to store the data, this means that the more dimensions you have, the more data you need to actually make a meaningful machine learning model. So dimensionality reduction is really important because um, the data sets that you're going to be working with are usually going to be, well, usually, are always going to be finite in the amount of data you actually have. So if you've got loads and loads of dimensions, all of which you think are useful, you're going to need a lot of data to actually solve your problems. So let's talk about machine learning use cases for security. Um, one thing I'll mention here is that machine learning is not easy. Um, there are loads of accessible libraries and toolkits, but we still need skilled developers that are not only skilled in machine learning, but also in domain knowledge of security whenever we're trying to solve for security use cases. Uh, machine learning and security is broadly divided into pattern recognition and anomaly detection. They're easy to conflate, but they have different goals. In pattern Pattern recognition, we try to detect, and um, I really should have these there. Uh, we, we try to detect characteristics in data, and these characteristics can be used to teach an algorithm to recognize data that is similar and has similar characteristics. Yeah. Anomaly detection, on the other hand, tries to baseline normal, find a statistical average of the data that is normal, and find deviations from that in order to inform a model about possibly bad things happening in security. <coughs> now, um, the list I have up there, IDS, Intrusion Detection Systems, are a place where we'll often use machine learning. Uh, for malware analysis, you can always, you can often use machine learning to group malware into certain <coughs> types. Uh, for spam and phishing detection, you can use a, a categorization model to uh, define whether something is spam or ham or phishing or not phishing. And for domain generation algorithm generated domain detection, um, machine learning is also really useful for that. And let's take a deep dive into anomaly detection for intrusion detection systems. Uh, I will mention that a lot of these examples are taken from this book right there, and I will give you a list of references later on. So, um, what I want to think about is why you would use machine learning instead of a heuristic system and model in the first place. So let's say we're building an IDS and we've got um, a bunch of rules that we need to write. Um, so let's say we've got a database and we've got a bunch of users and they will need to query the database a certain amount of times per day. And we think that an attacker, this is our threat model, will be querying the database a lot because they want to get all of the data out of the database and they don't know how to select stuff. Um, so let's say we write a rule that says users will usually query the database 10 times a day and if they query it more than 10 times, that is an anomaly. So each time a 
user queries the database, maybe we'll run an is anomaly function with the user ID um, as the, uh, the I don't do software engineering very well, do I? <laughs> with uh, the user ID as the key, and uh, we'll figure out whether um, whether the the query is an anomaly or not. However, obviously, this makes us ask lots of questions, like how do we set the threshold? Is ten a good number? Um, do we maybe need to use a higher one or a lower one, depending on? who the user is. Maybe a DB admin would need it more often than, let's say, a receptionist. And when do we update the threshold? So using machine learning can actually help us avoid such questions and let the data inform us about how to make those decisions. So let's try and come up with a solution to the threshold problem. Maybe instead of 10, we could use an average. So what we'll do is we will measure the amount of times that users will query the database each day, and we will divide that average, let's say, by 24 to get an average per hour. And then we'll multiply that times maybe five just to account for you know people using the database differently at different times. Then, once we've got that, we still need to account for certain things, like the roles, for example. So maybe we need to say that um, a data analyst will need to query the database more times than the receptionist. Don't know why I'm picking on him. Um, and then we might need to take into account things like weekends, holidays, etc. Now, although this is still heuristics, you kind of begin to see why we need machine learning in these situations, because this is getting more and more complex. And obviously, this is just one little use case. And usually, we're dealing with huge systems and you know big or even small companies where we need to define these things for lots and lots of different users and lots of different situations. So you can see that the, um, the updating of the average would be this machine learning <coughs> Anomaly detect or the hourly threshold update would be this continuous training process that machine learning uses, and this machine learning can later use um, can be triggered by more complex conditions, and it can take into account a, more, a lot more variables than just one. <coughs> also, we can talk about, um, for example, not using the average in the first place. We could, for example, start using things like the mean, uh, because that accounts for uh, outliers, etc. So, whenever we're building anomaly detection systems for an intrusion detection system, we need to fulfill certain objectives. Now, our first and probably most <coughs> important objective is going to be a low false positives and false negatives. Now, a false positive would be a um, alert that comes up and says this is anomalous when actually it's fine and it isn't. And a false negative, probably a little worse, is whenever something comes through, is an anomaly, is malicious, and we just don't alert on it at all. Now, it's very difficult to get a balance of these things because it's difficult to baseline normal, and alerts could be fired and be false alarms a lot. Now, if we generate lots and lots of false positives, we could say, well, at least we're not having any false negatives, but it deteriorates our trust in the system, and analysts won't take the alerts seriously from a human level, and also the volume of them that we generate could be so large that we don't actually ever get to analyze them at all. Trust in the system is really, really important in these situations. Another objective that we need to account for is seasonality, so adapting to changing trends in the data. So in the situation of these database of the database querying, we need to account for things like weekends, we need to account for things like holidays. In an IDS in general, we might need to, you know, account for tax season or um, patch Tuesday or different things where there will be anomalous behaviors on the network as it is. If your machine learning model doesn't account for these things from the start, you are going to end up with either loads of false positives that your analysts won't be able to triage at all, or you're just going to miss these things entirely. And they could 
um, and attackers could use these kinds of times to hide behind the high track volume of data. Um, another th objective that we need to solve for is resource efficiency. Now this is a little bit of a contentious issue. Some people think that latency is the most important thing whenever you're uh, designing an IDS. Uh, we know that data breaches, I think, on average take like 10 days to uh, to find on a network. Um, that might be an old statistic, I'm not sure. But latency is really important, and some machine learning models are really resource intensive and can't be done fast. So whenever you're choosing your model, you need to make sure that you've got the right data and the right model so that you can solve these problems very fast. And the last objective that I'm going to talk about, and obviously you've got a lot more, is uh, the explainability of alerts. We'll go into this later on, but at a basic level, if you've got a rule like um, if somebody queries a database 11 times, that's an anomaly, and that alert fires, it's really easy to explain it. However, when you've got a machine learning model and you've got all of these different algorithms working together in different ways, and an alert fires, an analyst might look at it and say, well, I don't know why that's an anomaly. And so optimizing for explainability is actually really important because it also improves on the latency of response if there is an intrusion. Now, whenever we're going to build an anomaly detection system for, um, for an IDS, we need to think about feature engineering. So selecting the right features is very, very important. You might find that your algorithm that you want to use needs specific types of data. So maybe it needs time series data, or maybe it needs data of a certain dimension. Um, you need to make sure that you're collecting this data at the right frequency, in the right way, and in a way that's usable for your machine learning model. Your goal here is to distill really complex information into a complex form, removing unnecessary data. So the relevancy of your metrics is actually really important when you're building your machine learning model, and you need to take a lot of time to make sure that once you've got a data set, you clean it up correctly so that you can build a good model. Now, at this point, I will also mention one other thing, which is the difficulty of getting data for these problems. So there are a few data sets available online that are open source that you can just download and work with. However, I think there's only kind of one newish one. This is specifically for IDS, but for other security problems as well. There's a few that are also kind of 20 years old from DARPA, but in general, like you need to, if you're building a machine learning model to actually work in a security environment in let's say some kind of company or your home network if you're really paranoid, um, then you need to work with the data that is actually going to be available whenever you're using the model. So it is kind of a, an issue here and a trade-off that if you want this to be, I don't know, marketed as a startup and sold to some company, you will need to get that company's data. And that's usually kind of difficult to get. Personally, I think the best way is to go and work for a company that will let you do this kind of stuff. But that's just me. So once you've got your data, your features, <coughs> Um, you need to do the machine learning. And there is no one-size-fits-all solution to this. Um, you will likely have to experiment a lot and explore lots of different models to actually select the one that is going to solve your problem best. You need to account for whether there is anomalies in your data or not, for example. Um, if, you, if there aren't any anomalies in your data and you know this, your task is actually a little different. What you're going to try and do is novelty detection. So you will be using models that define normalcy and then we'll be able to see whenever there is an anomaly from that. Uh, if there are already anomalies in your data and you know this, then you will be doing outlier detection. So you will try and be, you will be trying to look for outliers. So you could, for example, use these clustering algorithms and try and find the outliers on your own. You might be in a situation where you don't know if your data has anomalies or not, in which case you're probably best off just assuming there are and working from that assumption, and then if you can't find any, you can change. But 
This process is not easy and it will take ages, but you might get there in the end. Now, challenges in anomaly detection. The cost of error in this specific situation is huge. Um, misclassification of an anomaly can cause a crippling breach, thousands, millions of pounds lost for your company. Um, raising false positive alerts all the time can have a less drastic impact, but could also mean that your analysts will become fatigued with the amount of alerts that they are getting. Um, and in general, it could degrade, again, the trust in your system. Somebody's alarm clock's going off. That's good. Please do wake up. <laughs> um, oh, got lost there. So, uh, it's very important um, that you also understand the semantic gap issue. Um, because this is the explainability thing that we were talking about earlier. If you build a system that works really, really well, but whenever you have an alert, your analyst or the person that's dealing with it isn't able to explain why it came about, then you're going to lose firstly a lot of time on between when the analyst can take the alert and figure out why it was an anomaly and deal with it. And secondly, um, you, you're going to lose resources and your machine learning model ne will need to be updated so that your explainability will become better. So it's actually really good to take your um, model from the very start and invest in making sure that the alerts are explainable, even if it takes more resources from the very start. Um, and the one last thing I'll mention here is the adversarial impact uh, on machine learning. So if you've got a threat actor that is trying to target your system and your model is operating in an untrusted environment, if they have seen Stu's talk who said that, you know, the best way to find the holes in a security, in a company's security is to go on their job specs. And if they have gone to your company's LinkedIn and see that you're looking for machine learning analysts that are very good at this specific type of anomaly detection, they will know what you're looking for. And they could try and poison the data in a way that will make your machine learning models fail. So it's always very important to account for this kind of thing. And I frankly don't really know how, and it's out of scope for this talk. So um, the conclusion for anomaly detection um, it's really important for security. There have been successful applications of it in machine learning. Before diving into complex algorithms and trying to figure out which, what cool maths will solve your problem, it's really important to consider the problem you're actually trying to solve. And you should be aiming to keep simplicity as one of your key goals whenever you're um, designing your solution. Um, Security systems, especially uh, heuristic ones, have the potential to grow uncontrollably to a scale that is way too big and difficult to manage. With machine learning, you're also facing the same issues. So it's always really important to make sure you document everything and understand why everything is happening. So why do we need machine learning in security in general? And I think some people might actually not agree with me and might say that you actually don't need it. And security has kind of been working for a few years without it. But in general, because machine learning performs well in a stochastic environment, it can help us efficiently ad identify threats. It can adapt to new behaviors, and it is much better than humans at analyzing large data sets with, uh, with new information coming in all the time. Um, let's also address the the issue of machine learning replacing, replacing human analysts at all, uh, in general. Um, I don't think that this is going to be a problem. I think that as we get more machine learning, we're just going to hire more machine learning developers. Um, obviously, I think maybe in a SOC, maybe some analysis isn't going to be necessary in the long term. Uh, however, I think that most of the applications that I've seen personally and the ones that I've read about are actually just getting rid of the boring stuff that analysts need to do. Uh, so 
I don't think that it is going to completely replace the security community. However, you know, I might have to eat my words one day. So, um, I'm coming to the end of my talk. I think it's gone a lot quicker than I expected. Oh well. So, um, let's talk about learning more. So, the way that I started learning about this was doing this course here, which is on Pluralsight. Pluralsight is, um, I think you can get one or three months for free, but you do have to pay for it after that. Um, this is not the only course that's available online. There's absolutely tons. I do recommend doing one if you don't have the opportunity to go and take one of these courses at university, for example. The machine learning course on Coursera uh, from Stanford is um, apparently the best one ever, but they use MATLAB, so I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> However, it is supposed to be very, very good, and a lot of the people that I have worked with have taken this course and have um, been very positive about it. It's very comprehensive and explains all the maths. Um, Scikit-learn is what I used to do all of my uh, machine learning endeavors. It is fantastic, and even just the documentation for it can teach you a lot. If you are struggling to understand how some algorithm works, just look at the docs and look at the, the little kind of example that Scikit-learn <coughs> is going to give you, because that, like, if you actually understand it line by line, you should be able to figure out why your thing isn't working. Um, also, this O'Reilly book, Machine Learning and Security, was really, really great and helped write this talk, I have to say. So, um, lastly, machine learning is really difficult. Um, so, if you are trying to learn it and it's not really working out, don't get discouraged. Like, it does take a long time, and finding some kind of mentor or finding somebody who can explain things to you, I think, is the best way because some of these problems you can't just keep bashing your head against. You do need to actually have some kind of insight, especially into the mathematics of how a problem works. So um, I think it's really important to go to these meetups, and they're not security people. If you go to a machine learning or AI meetup, they're very different. So it's not like this. They're less friendly. <laughs> Quite a lot. Um, they all think they're so smart. Uh, but <laughs> but like, it is a really good place to meet people and to talk about things. And if you ask one of them a question, they will go on for hours, not generalizing or anything. Um, yeah, so don't get discouraged. If you could take your phone out right now, and I hope this still works, go to bit.do slash hella survey. You could, that's hella with one L. Uh, you can fill out a little survey about this talk and I can gather your data and analyze it with machine <laughs> learning. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for coming to my talk. Uh, and I am very happy to take any questions right now. I have done machine learning before, and I did learn a lot, so thank you very much. Okay. The, so. the question was that, uh, sorry, I'm just repeating it for the microphone, that machine learning does teach you a lot. But yeah, I absolutely agree. So I um, um, just want to, I was curious, I mean, when you've done machine learning, have you done it for industry or academically? Or? So the question is whether I did machine learning for industry or academically. Uh, so I'm currently on placement uh, in a bank, and one of my projects that I undertook during my placement was a kind of proof of concept machine learning project, which I'm not really allowed to go into detail about because. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, the question is tricky. Then. <laughs> but, I, I was interested to know if, if you if you started like from the kid, like scikit learn and stuff like that, or did you consider any kind of existing products? out there that package the machine learning inside? Um, okay, so I can't, um, so for me personally, I was given the project from kind of a higher level, so I didn't really get to choose. Um, I can't comment on what happens in the company I work for. Uh, however, in general, in the industry, I have definitely seen um, a lot of criticism of different kind of machine learning security products and uh, kind of the approach that I've seen has been that 
they because they need so much fine tuning and because data in a big company is so different across different companies, you might actually find that they don't work very well. But that's just talking to a few people that isn't a representative data set whatsoever. So, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't take this at face value. Is, is machine learning and security applications actually machine learning? Like, like I know like dark trace, like they're like mad AI crap. There was a lot of like you know word on the street a while ago that actually it wasn't machine learning or AI it was just standard signature based crap and then a big good marketing. Thing. So like how much of it is actually yeah. machine learning? So I'll go back to where is it? This slide. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, Okay, I won't comment on any specific products. Um, although Dark, Dark Trace does have a very, um, well, a, a very interesting talk on YouTube that you can watch uh, from their, um, you know, machine learning experts that explains a little bit about what happens in the black box. Um, I think that there are, you know, machine learning is like a regression problem, right? That is machine learning. Uh, if you apply it in the right way. So I think a lot of these things are just predicting something that's going to happen in the future. And you could think, well, that's a bit simplistic. But, you know, if you look at the definition, machine learning is like the, the solution that they're using. Um, I don't think I can really comment in general. I think there's definitely places that employ machine learning experts and do use machine learning models. Um, but I think... In general, I, I'm not sure what the law is on false advertising. I don't know if you're allowed to say that you use machine learning uh, if you don't. Uh, but then again, I don't think that the lawmakers could ever really check because they don't know enough. So I don't know. It's a good question. I'm not sure how to answer it, to be completely honest. Any other questions? With seeing none, um, that's the end of my talk. Thank you so much.